to our series. So today, our first, uh, we start with our first topic, and it will be about self harm. Ross, how do you see self harm, or how do you perceive it? <clears throat> oh, well, I think specialising with children and young people, mm -hmm. so six to nineteen year olds, uh, I see it quite commonly. Probably about twenty five to thirty percent of my caseload would have uh, young people on there who are self harming or perhaps are cutting or just self-harming in different ways as well. Uh, it's always something that I find must be worked through and something that a young person must engage in face-to-face -face therapy with. Even though we're talking about it today, it's unlikely that, well actually, we should say that we need people to go and see a mental health professional for oh, things yes. like self-harm. Uh, but there are things that people can do at home or in their daily life that can, let's say, reduce the symptoms, perhaps have a knock-on effect on improving their self-worth and their self-esteem, so then maybe they don't cut or self-harm as much. Um, from a CBT's perspective, it's very much about challenging unhelpful behaviours related to routine or habits around self-harm, as well as helping someone to adjust the way they think or to challenge some of those negative thoughts that they might have. Typically speaking, with young people, I find that if they're self-harming, they will have what we call negative automatic thoughts. So these automatic, daily, negative assumptions or beliefs that they hold about themselves, their life, their future, will be in a negative trend. So one of the key things I'd want to work, them, work with them on throughout the, the course of the intervention uh, would be challenging those thoughts making their beliefs a little bit more neutral or balanced mm -hmm. so that they, they spend less time thinking in such a negative way. By doing this, and it's a key part of the intervention, but by doing this, uh, it almost allows us to be able to go into the challenging of behaviours or habits that are unhelpful mm -hmm. in maintaining self-harm or cutting behaviours. Some of those uh, behavioural interventions would include really creating quite a big shift in how the young person uh, approaches times of the day, especially particularly the evening, which is where I see most people will cut or self-harm at night time. It's quieter, there's less people around, uh, it's more peaceful. The ritual or routine associated with the self-harming can almost be fulfilled without interruption. Uh, so a lot of my work with it is uh, around challenging unhelpful behaviours. So like I said, nighttime being the most, one of the most prominent times that self someone will cut. Uh, it's very much about creating some kind of shift in their routine in the evening. So, and it's not the case for everyone, but a lot of young people that I meet with tend to cut or self-harm either in their bedroom or in the bathroom. Perhaps shower uh, or in the bath or in bed. So what I try and do is, uh, implement a strategy whereby it kind of cuts the cycle of self-harming. So rather than them going to bed knowing that they're going to self-harm, if they've got awareness of this and they really want to change, I'll give them some tips and strategies for how to kind of minimize the risk of doing that, which might be things like, uh, well actually, spend less time on your own. So make sure you're not in your bedroom for the few hours leading up to bedtime. Make sure you stay out of your bedroom and when you go to bed, you actually intend to sleep. Uh, around showers, it, this might sound a little bit brutal, but what I say to people is, well, why don't you shift from having a warm or a hot shower to a very cold one? Make your showers very functional yeah. because who wants to stay in a cold shower and cut at the same time? Like it's. It's not a solution as such, but it's just another strategy to employ to reduce the risk of cutting. So cold showers, uh, I typically recommend to people, the thoughts you have at nighttime or during the day will to some degree or a, a big degree lead to the cutting or the self-harming. So let's try and change those thoughts that you have at nighttime. Rather than listening to music that perhaps you've got into a habit to, where you self-harm, like some people will have these routines around I'll be in this place, listening to this music or this TV show will be on, breaking those. So rather than listening to perhaps sad-ish type music, put something on that's a bit more energetic, something on that you really enjoy, something that's upbeat, 
With 15, 16 year olds, I typically refer or recommend someone like Pharrell. A lot of his music is kind of like quite punchy and upbeat, and it just has an opportunity to put you in a different space when you're thinking. But it's really about changing any habit we can to try and reduce the cutting. That's priority number one, reduce it, because we know it's really difficult to just stop like this, because actually what you do then what the, you know, the young person does is they almost handicap themselves. Mm. Without that opportunity to release those really distressing emotions, well actually, it could lead to something more risky happening. My experience is always because, you know, I don't work with uh, younger people, I work with adults, mm -hmm. that if, uh, either you, you, still, you have them and they're still struggling with the self-harm, or it has moved into another dysfunctional behavior. Yeah. And then we would ask them and they would say, yes, uh, I, rem I, used to, I used to cut when I was younger and it was never addressed and, that's, and that becomes... So I try as much as I can uh, with adults is to um, not only re uh, replace the behavior, but actually look at those feelings that they're struggling yeah. with, that they cannot express and they cannot get out of their system. It's that it leads them to need that, those uh, cutting or um, yeah. in order to release that emotional pain in a physical manner. So, um, so that, that's what I see a lot in adults. I don't see as many um, self-harm cases as uh, my caseload is not as heavy with it as, as yours, but I see it as, as it transforms into something else. Um, yeah. Alcohol abuse, yeah. um, dysfunctional relationships, abusive relationships. Um, abuse of any other uh, substance. I think you've, you've brought a topic up there that's really, really pertinent. That early intervention in, across any mental health concern oh. is how you reduce the predisposition for an adult mental health concern becoming more prevalent. Yes. So I think uh, me working with these teenagers, I think the youngest typically that I'd work with who is cutting is perhaps 13, 12 or 13, which is so young if you think about it. It's not always cutting. There's obviously, as you touched on, different types of self-harm, but it's something that I see and I'm continuing to see more and more of the time. And, uh, you know, whereas I suppose traditionally it's, or maybe perhaps not in the, the adult population, but young people that I see, Typically, it's not too well con concealed. Yes. You know, it's in places where if you were looking, you'd be able to spot it. And, you know, that often tells me a lot about young people, that they've got all of these distressing emotions, but they don't want to keep them to themselves. Mm. That doesn't mean they want to tell everyone that they're cutting, but they want people to notice they're not okay mm. and they're reaching out for support, uh, which actually I think is a, a very kind of great step in the right direction. At least it allows an opportunity to talk about it and for other people to be able to support and reach out. But I don't know, do you see the same or similar trends in adults? With adults, they actually uh, work harder towards concealing it because the, the, as you said, when there's, there isn't an, inter, an early intervention, the disorder or the dysfunctional behavior becomes so entrenched mm. that it's hard for them to let it go because they don't know what they would be without it, that that becomes a coping mechanism, as unhealthy as it is, it is their coping mechanism with whatever they're going through. So um, offering them alternative ways when they're younger helps them deal at, when they get older. But if they don't have this opportunity, what it becomes is, is that it, it develops with them and it becomes part of their identity. So it's much harder to actually uh, work with it yeah. uh, with adults than, than with um, and with younger people. Maybe it shows in different ways, it like you said, it, ways, it's not just the self-harming, it develops into maybe more into comorbid. Into, into, it develops into an eating disorder. How many of, uh, I mean, yeah, how many clients do you see who self-harm and then eventually yeah. develop an eating disorder? It is a way to self-harm. Uh, you see it with all of the different kinds of addiction, with um, if isolating themselves, uh, high-risk behaviors yeah so um, so yeah it grows into something completely different but mm -hmm. it, it could be but it starts with the self-harm 
Yeah, I completely agree with that. I think even some young adults, uh, late teenagers that I've seen, if they've been in this type of self-harming behavior for you know, a couple of years or a few years, you're right, it does start to, they believe it starts to form part of their identity. Mm -hmm. Like, and they'd start asking maybe me questions like, well, I don't know what I'd be without the self-harming or even without depression anymore. Yeah. So that's, that with depression as well, a lot. Yeah, and I think a lot of the time it's really difficult for people to be able to, to uh, identify that even change is possible. Hope really reduces mm -hmm. and I, that's part of our job to help people bring back that hope that things can be different again. A lot that I do with young people, and it's again this proactive CBT style, is that typically people that are self-harming or have depression have this low self-worth, low self-esteem. So very early on in the intervention, I would be looking to help them create some positive self-talk. The, the real rule of positive self-talk is it has to be 100% truthful. So. We can't tell ourselves today is going to be a great day if we don't really believe it can be a great day. If we've had three years of bad days, it's going to be hard to, for our brain to suddenly think that. So instead I work a little bit more kind of foundation level. Okay, well let's maybe come up with three things you think you're good enough, adequate or even good at. It might be, uh, okay, I can concentrate for 30 minutes at a time or uh, I can, I'm okay at drawing, I'm okay at painting, I'm good at listening to music, I'm good at keeping a routine, I'm good at brushing my teeth at night time, I'm good at taking a shower at night, I'm good at getting in bed on time. You know, three or four things which a lot of us take for granted uh, in terms of, okay, well they're quite small behaviours, they're not really going to make a difference. But actually when we constantly repeat the positive things or at least the neutral things we do in a day, our brain has to start remembering it. And they gradually start becoming the automatic thoughts that we have. It's, um, it's a lengthy process, or it can be, typically speaking, uh, with depression and self-harm, or you know, with just self-harm. Uh, it's a number of sessions before things can really start to change. But developing self-talk, as well as changing the way we behave towards the self-harming or the habits we've developed around it, are really the starting points for me. That's where we start with, and then the content of every session there afterwards is about challenging the negative thoughts, these repetitive ones we have each day. What would be the warning signs that you would, um, that parents should be looking for, for if, if they're looking for their kids? It can, they are, it can be really difficult, because a proportion of the of people that self-harm will conceal, so it's, unless, you know, you're going to the pool with the, the young person or the child or the beach or you're seeing them when they come out of the shower, it's going to be really difficult at times to see the cuts. Uh, typical things that I would look for that would encourage me to ask those questions in a therapy session, definitely exploring mood. So if there is a sign or if there are signs or symptoms of low mood, low self-esteem, low self-worth, I would most probably be asking questions about are you having any dark thoughts? Are you having any suicidal thoughts? Have you ever thought about acting on them? How do you um, kind of express that distress you're going through? So low mood, someone presenting with low mood, I'd want to be asking that. Someone that isolates themselves, appears a bit withdrawn, perhaps has some um, change around sleeping habits or bedtime habits. Uh, someone that stops socializing so much. I suppose some of the more obvious things to look for someone covering up their body unnecessarily. Mm. You know, if they're going outside and perhaps wearing a jumper, especially in the heat that we have here, you might want to just consider, okay, well, is there something else going on here that could be self-harm? Um, there's lots of things, I think. The, the main thing I would suggest is if a parent is worried about low mood or self-esteem or self-harming, to ask the young person. You know, it, you don't have to ask directly, like, are you cutting? But I think if you're worried about mental health concerns in that regard, spend a little bit more one-to-one -one time, uh, go out and do some activities together where perhaps the young person can feel less stressed or at least amount of stress in their day, nice and relaxed. Listen and ask questions. 
you know, try and get to, to understand a little bit more about what might be going on for them. I think um, a lot of young people uh, may start self-harming for lots of different reasons. Things like worries about body image or their, their appearance, being bullied at school, uh, not doing so well in grades or exams, especially if there's, they feel pressure from themselves or other people to do really well. These are the kind of things that could trigger off bouts or episodes of self-harming, or like a breakup with a boyfriend or a, girl, a girlfriend, or a breakdown in kind of friendships generally, can be big causes too. Divorce? Divorce, yeah. Uh, I have to say, it's, it's not something I've seen where there is a direct, almost instant relationship with that. Um, divorce will of course create, inst or can create instability amongst the family and the dynamics. Uh, can lead to lots of questions around what's our future going to look like, what's the family unit going to look like, which can trigger off low mood, or even low self-esteem. A lot of the young people that I meet with, where there has been divorce, I say a lot, some of them for sure, ask the question, did I do something wrong that's made my parents break up? Yes. Like it's really common and it almost sounds, I mean, to parents I'm sure at times it sounds probably a little bit irrational. Like, well, of course you didn't do anything wrong that's, you know, this is about me and dad or me and mum that's, that's not working. But it, it certainly is something that can interfere with mood. And whenever there's an interference with mood, self-harming behaviour can develop. I think it's probably the most comorbid uh, relationship that we see. Depression and self-harm, uh, as well as anxiety and depression. But it's, if someone, you know, stays long enough in a low mood, they're perhaps going to look for resources to be able to express that distress. Mm. Self-harming is one that young people tell me is, can be really effective for them in the moment. Yeah. Do you, I, I try to think of, uh, of reasons why self-harm is increasing and I, um, and I sometimes, now that we make social media the devil and we blame it for everything, I no. sometimes wonder if social media plays a role in that. Especially how, when you look at it, when you see how people comment on each other's um, yeah. um, accounts, they can be mean. Yeah. I see stuff and I'm like... There is a lot of meanness. There is. And perhaps we hear a little bit more about that than the, all the positive comments that people yes. may receive. I don't know. Uh, but what I would say is certainly, I think, I believe I've seen an increase in body image, eating concerns, body dysmorphic traits, perhaps as a result of social media. You know, I, I get a lot of young, the young people that I see with body image concerns typically have two or three people that they're following who are kind of have their goal body or their dream body. And uh, I think that can be quite a difficult proposition for young people when they see someone that's got many, many followers and gets very positive remarks about their body. When sometimes I look at those profiles and I think, well, actually that person looks quite significantly underweight or perhaps they're battling something here. But the young person themselves don't see that because they see all of this positivity, mm -hmm. or a lot, not all, a lot of positivity around the, what someone posts and the way that they look. Uh, I think there's just been a big shift in trend there. There's much more accessibility now yes. to to seeing people post things about their life and their body. Uh, I don't think we can blame social media so much. I think also a lot of people have a lot more awareness around mental health nowadays. Uh, even kind of labels and diagnoses and names. So I think it's good in a sense that more people have awareness and that they have an opportunity to reach out. Uh, hopefully that means reduce, the, the, the stigma around mental health has been reducing too. But I really think that, um, that young people can take some benefits from social media too. I usually tell my clients to be, to be selective and I even do that with myself. I'm very selective about who I'm going to follow yeah. um, and what kind of message I'm uh, exposing myself to on a daily yeah. basis. Yeah. So so that it doesn't it doesn't affect anyone uh, negatively. Yeah. So um, I'm wondering if you do that with your with the kids as well. I do. I encourage it, of course, to be following people who perhaps can be good role models. Yes. Um, 
it's not always that easy because we all make mistakes, you know, and the people that, you know, our social media kind of, or present as social media role models to young people and adults don't always get it right either. Uh, but I think there's a vast majority of people on social media who, who want to do the right thing and want to present themselves as uh, being genuine and authentic. But because of the nature of mental health, I think sometimes someone that is struggling can become quite fixated on one or two profiles and almost eliminate all of the, or some of the positive role models out there and they kind of just fixate on one or two people that they want to look like or want to be like. And as we know... I remember know, that being like that when I was yeah, a teenager. Yeah, I think we all can relate to it. Yeah. I think it typically only becomes a problem or would more significantly become a problem if someone is perhaps predisposed to mental health exactly. concerns or have been struggling. And also the intensity. Yeah. We, we didn't have this kind of intensity when we were younger, so... It's... No, we didn't, and I think uh, nowadays people typically spend hours yeah. on social media on their phone. Hours on end sometimes. Uh, which I don't really think is particularly good for the brain. And I actually, as a side note, I always recommend to young people, try. I mean, best practice is to limit um, any electronic device up to two hours before you plan to go to sleep makes a huge difference in, in the quality of the sleep. It does. And often or sometimes I can see that people that do self-harm, especially those that cut, may spend prolonged periods of time on their phone, especially at night time or around their ritual when they're thinking about self-harming. Because, and this has come from a, a few people that I've met with, they've almost said that exposing themselves to an individual's profile where they have a similar body goal almost encourages them to cause themselves pain because they've not achieved what they wanted to yet. So I, I as, a no, as a rule, try to encourage people to be staying off their phone before they plan to sleep. Phone, laptop, even TV. And be very careful about what you expose yourself before you plan to go to sleep. Especially if that's when the self-harming is coming. Well, that was great. This was a very good talk. Um, please tune in to our channel and uh, let us know, message us and let us know what, what other topics you would like us to talk about. Thank you, Rob. Thank you very much, guys, and we'll see you again soon.